Thank you for all coming. Let's start uh, something new and start on time. How about that? Uh, we cannot manage it on in our classes and most of the seminars I entered start with a little bit like five, 10 minutes of uh, like um, Bayram's visit to my grandmothers. So let's do something different and appreciate the time and uh, we uh, start the seminar on time. Excellent. You come to our uh, weekly Tuesday seminars, which is a, a course requirements to our graduate student, which I am told is around 150 these days. Uh, it will be also a good opportunity for us to see each other's faces, whether we are still alive or not. But today we have a special guest, uh, a friend of mine, uh, a real research, uh, researcher, uh, did his uh, cardiac surgical training in um, four or five different countries, uh, Turkey, England, Netherlands, Germany, and even Japan. He studied histology and embryology for three years, completed his PhD in tissue engineering and biomaterial science in Tokyo University. Uh, he is no other than Sarda, Professor Sardar Gunaydin. So it is great pleasure to have him here. So uh, he always keeps himself busy. Currently he is a, a, a lecturer at Hacettep University, Ankara, a Biomedical Research Foundation, has affiliation, affiliations with Athens, Greece, Biomedical Research Foundation, uh, Glasgow, UK, at the, bio, at the uh, Stuck Clyde University, uh, also with USA, but his main affiliation is with the Ankara City Hospital, the biggest hospital, uh, Bilkan City Hospital. It's also affiliated with Sağlık um, Bakanlığı University, Medical Science University, I guess, but I don't know what the English version of it. So without further ado, I leave the floor to Professor Gunaydin. Uh, his talk is always eye-opening. He follows uh, the technological tra trends very closely and actively participates in national and international projects. So it's really a great pleasure to have him here to speak. So please watch it carefully. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Gunaydin. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, sir. Um, it's my great honor and privilege to be here with my friends and colleagues. And it's a great pleasure and thank you very much for your invitation. And I'm going to um, summarize what's going on in cardiac surgery from the perspective of uh, biomedical engineering. So I was also trained to be an engineer. So it's always my pleasure to be here with you because we can understand much clearly each other than speaking to surgeons. And so I start sharing the presentation and start discussing. Yes. And so as you know, um, the most uh, common cause of death in the world is unfortunately cardiovascular diseases. And each year it's estimated to be about, about around 17 million people worldwide and to cause um, to, to, to lose their lives. And it's the number one cause of death globally. And of course, approximately, it's about 30% of all mortality in the world in a year. And so we are trying to treat those kind of diseases. And so we need the uh, highest technology possible. So in, in Turkey, just want to give a uh, kind of perspective on the medical device industry. So this is uh, the data is extracted from the Turkish reports on Minister of Health. So as you know, um, in the world, um, the USA, of course, has the greatest share of medical device industry and Turkey's, unfortunately, less than 2%, 1%. So with respect to money, um, when US is around 120, 25 billion US dollars, Turkey is around $2.5 billion. And with respect to the, uh, uh, the ratio of the share for the health service expenditure and per capita, it's only 35 US dollars. It's nothing because the, um, the health expenditure is enormous. And even the health expenditure per capita is around $500. So it's 
less than 10% that we spend money on um, investments of innovation in Turkey to treat heart, uh, cardiovascular diseases. Because R&D investments are, as you know, completely very poor to compete with the international counterparts. Although it's increasing, of course, it's not sufficient. And with respect to the Innovation Performance Index, it's calculated to understand your place in the world. Turkey is unfortunately 52nd in 82 countries. Um, it's, of course, very low. If you an example from MIT, for example, if MIT was a country, it should be the 24th biggest economy in the world, based on only innovations. So uh, in Turkey, according to this latest report, why are we not competitive with the uh, innovation and industry medical industry in the world? Most of uh, the um, uh, people say that the cost and expenses are very high. Uh, the funds are lacking, and of course, the experience stuff is lacking, so which I never understand and believe. And um, a huge industry now in Turkey, uh, when we're talking about health issues. So even in the outpatient clinics, it's an enormous number. We are, we are having 800,000 people coming to our hospital to ask for help. So that means one Turkish citizen comes to the um, outpatient clinic 10 times a year. It's a huge number. And then about 15,000 uh, million of them are hospitalized. We have more than 5 million operations in Turkey. And when we are talking about the number of operations or number of admissions to the hospital, Turkey is in the front line. But when we are talking about technology, unfortunately, we're not very much competitive. So let's uh, start talking about the innovations in cardiac surgery. Usually, uh, when we are searching for top, top 10 innovations in surgery, the first one is genomics, 3D printing, data management, wearable technologies, artificial intelligence, mobile technologies, telemedicine, restorative medicine, nanotechnology, and robotic and interventional medicine. So um, the basics of surgical innovation, when we're talking about innovation in surgery, most of the people are usually omitting that a center who wants to be a, in a pioneer in surgical innovation should have the greatest number of case law because when you have experience, you can do something new as far as I believe. So the, my first um, idea is to have a significant caseload and surgical experience in that center. And second one is of course the history of research and culture because when you have a history, when you have a good past, you can com compete and you can have more collaborations. Of course, ex experience, faculty and stuff. So translation, the people who understand translational medicine, that's the point I'm always challenging for because uh, when you're talking with the clinicians, it's not very easy to make them understand what we're doing in the lab. Or when, when we come to this side, it's not easy to tell the people what we're doing in the operating room. So those people like us should be there to connect both sides. And infrastructure is, of course, very important. Funding and national or international cooperations are important. And of course, the per uh, important point is to have industrial connections. So I work here in Ankara City Hospital campus. It's um, one of the largest hospitals in Europe, yes, because we have about 4,000 beds, 700 ICU beds, and 131 operating rooms. It's a huge place. So um, from, for example, from my office to go to the operating room, every day I walk four kilometers. It's four kilometers, it's a huge hospital. So it is a great uh, case load. We last, before COVID, of course, we operated more than 4,000 heart surgery patients in the, in the hospital. We are using every type of technology, every type of patient, ECMO and heart support, uh, left ventricular assist devices, heart transplantation, lung transplantation, heart and lung transplantation, and pediatric cardiac surgery. So it's a huge uh, perspective and huge number of uh, and different patients. So, and I want to summarize, this is the idea of today, our ongoing research and to discuss with you some kind of maybe possible future projects together. So in cardiac surgery, the most um, advanced side is equipment, especially they're investing a lot for the heart-lung machine, because as you know, when we're doing operations, we stop the heart and the heart-lung machine is carrying all what we are doing. So protect the heart, brain or whatever. 
So Heartland Machine is improving day by day and year by year with the highest new technology you can use. And they all are in incorporated in the Heartland Machine. The first idea is to make this Heartland Machine smaller and portable. That means you can carry this machine all over the hospital. You can use it in the emergency, in some different clinics like cardiology or some other surgeries, and also in the cardiac surgery in the operating room. So this is an evolving process, and especially minimized circuitry are the hottest topic now in the Heartland Machine technology. So even we have a society, International Society of Minimum Invasive Extracorporeal Technology, and this is um, maybe the fifth year that this um, uh, society was built. And I'm in the, um, uh, the, I'm the uh, vice man, uh, pres president of this society. And we are doing a lot of ongoing research to um, kind of to try to persuade our uh, colleagues to use minimally invasive circuits and portable circuits that can be available all over the hospital. So we also have a patent in a different version of uh, cardiopulmonary bypass machine that can be used um, very condensed and, and very much portable. So we published papers on this and books, and then it's an ongoing hot research. So the idea is always make smaller and portable parts of the hydrogen machine to, to carry all over the uh, uh, hospital. Another technology that's always evolving is the valve technology. So as you know, for the heart valves, we are using mechanical heart valves or bioprosthesis and also some uh, homographs. Homographs are just taken from the uh, uh, humans, so it's not very much available, especially in Turkey, you have difficulty. So we're trying to use bioprosthesis, and it's an incredibly uh, ongoing res uh, research and new innovations. Because when I was a resident, let's say 25, 30 years ago, we were using bioprosthesis that were only, um, let's say, durable for at most five to 10 years. But now we are using bioprosthesis technology that can go on up to 30 years, 35 years. So it's a very huge step for the biotechnology in uh, bioprosthesis and heart valves. So um, we are using minimally invasive surgery. That's why the heart valve is very important. Most of the heart valves are done with stents inside. This stand technology is completely different and evolving day by day. And so just genetic engineered stands or some different biocompatible stands. But the idea is to make the smaller, to put in the small in, in incisions inside the patients very easily or interventionally in the cat lab. So the idea is having smaller and smaller um, valves and it's a very um, completely uh, growing uh, side of the cardiac surgery. So the idea is in cardiac surgery, the, the hottest topics are minimally invasive heart lung machines and minimally invasive cardiac surgery. And also this is also appealing for many patients. So even in Turkey, when they come to us, they say, I want to have a minimally invasive surgery. So that's a very good conscious going on. And another part of stenting is uh, the vascular surgery. As you know, there are many, many different technologies that we are using in vascular surgery in vascular stenosis, and it's always available, especially for emergency cases. So this is a very emergency case uh, to have a patient with the aortic aneurysm rupture, and we just put a stand in the cat lab, and we just solve the problem in half less than half an hour. If it were an open surgery, it would go up to six, seven hours, and the results would be much more poor. So it's um, also a very good point of investment to find some new and condensed uh, circuits to use this. Also for rotis artery stenting. So it's also very popular now that we are using different parts of vascular stenosis to treat with stenting, even in venous disease. So usually the stents were used in the arteries before, and now we are using them in deep vein thrombosis. So it's a venous disease and it used to be treated um, only medical treatments, but now we are using stents and some different techniques to treat also the venous side of the disease. And let's come to the disposables. So in disposables are of course, one of the top, um, top equipments that we're using in cardiac surgery. And the initial idea was to use surface coated disposables all over the cardiac surgery. Especially in hardline machine, we use oxygenators to oxygenate the blood 
filters to filter anything coming from the patient's side. And now they are all covered with um, kind of surface coatings, different chemicals, different technologies. And it's also, we are always having a new one, a new one. Cellular therapy is, um, of course, as you can see, is very much rapidly growing side of cardiac and vascular surgery. So I, when I was training in, in Japan, like 20 years ago, when I was doing my PhD, it was a very new concept to use a stem cell therapy in, uh, in heart disease or vascular disease. So in that time, 25 years ago, we were doing this uh, valve leaflet. This is an aortic valve. And this is the leaflet, as maybe you know, there's a three different leaflets in the aortic valve. And we were just producing these leaflets uh, with the stem cells on the polymer sheets 25 years ago. And then of course, it just went on rapidly. And then um, we even operated patients at that time in, it was a very special, special fund from the Japanese government to use only in 25 pediatric patients. And the results were very much uh, successful. And even our group went to US, started studying in Yale University to export the information from Japan to US. And again, has very um, successful results. So idea was to collect blood from the patient to just have some myofibroblasts and stem cells and then a kind of mixture in the specific chemicals and suspension, and then do echocardiography, ultrasound, and measure all different kinds of uh, dimensions, and then just um, use some incubators to increase the number of stem cells in the lab, just incorporate them with the cells and the structure, and then just reimplant to the patient. So um, this was the idea, and this, let's say didn't go very, very much successful. It's not very much widespread to use in cardiac surgery at that time, even now, because we have much better bioprosthesis technology as I mentioned before. So now it turns out to be used in vascular surgery in especially critical limb ischemia. So critical limb ischemia is a very difficult disease to treat because people comes to us with a huge pain in the leg because there is no perfusion in the leg. And you try, you cannot do surgery, you cannot do stenting because they are very small vessels and, and the patients are suffering. So stem cell therapy was the first one to be used in those kind of patients. And we even used stem cells just taken from the patient, from um, the adipose tissue of the patient. And we used, um, we just collected them, uh, processed, and then gave it back to the patient. So uh, we studied this with the nuclear imaging techniques because is you know, you lose stem cells after you give to the patient because you need to do some markings and it's very uh, much expensive to afford. So we did um, nuclear perfusion imaging to understand if this works or not. So after that, we understand that we are giving the cells back to the patient. They have no pain. This is a very good improvement. The patients are very much satisfied. But the idea is we, when we check the perfusion, there is no difference in perfusion in nuclear imaging. So we cannot understand why this pain is going away, but there's no perfusion. And then we employed PET imaging. So it's another um, technology, nuclear medicine. It measures the glucose metabolism. So this is the uh, control leg, and this is the uh, stem cell leg. So we demonstrated that when you use stem cell therapy here, you start a new metabolism with respect to the other one. This is the control group. So, but unfortunately, after two months, this goes away. So this is a very temporary therapy that gives the patient this kind of new metabolism to override the pain and some other symptoms of the patient, but not perfusion, we, we couldn't demonstrate that. So this metabolism just slips away after two months. So this is an idea that we're trying to solve. And we also use uh, wound healing is another new um, era of attention because uh, we have very difficult wounds to treat. So platelet gel is a concentration of platelets that you know has some tissue factors, growth, growth factors inside. So with the platelet gel technology, we can increase those factors up to eight times to use in the wound healing. So it's uh, very much available to 
um, to heal most of the very large wounds very easily, and it's very available now in the market. We also use platelets and different modes of platelets. They are now available in every type of surgery, including cardiac surgery or uh, especially for plastic surgery. And this is another new uh, concept that we are dealing with with the new two projects. We are going to maintain this. This is the mitochondrial transplantation. So it's um, a new concept for us in cardiac surgery. Uh, three years ago, I was in Boston Children's Hospital and I saw them uh, this clinically. They applied mitochondrial cells uh, received from the muscles of the pediatric patient and they were transplanted into heart and those patients survived. So this was a very good step for us. And we started doing research on mitochondrial. It's not easy to collect mitochondria to, um, to be um, sure that you have all mitochondrias and then transplant back. So we started with our group of uh, patients in the uh, Yulhane Medical Center here in Ankara. And we just demonstrate mitochondrias after transplantation. So we used animal models uh, renal ischemia perfusion injury in rats, and now we are using even in uh, COVID induced rats and in, in another technology. But I believe this is a good feature for uh, clinical indications to use in, in the new feature. And 3D printing is, of course, you know much better than me. We usually uh, we started using it with our group in um, in Glasgow. Uh, Strathclyde University. So the idea was, of course, to uh, produce vascular grafts for us. It's important because um, we measure everything, every size before the operation by um, CT scans or MRI scans, and then we produce 3D technology with the grafts. And in, in, the, uh, in Glasgow, for example, they are putting some kinds of uh, pressure monitor, uh, pressure sensors in the 3D bioprinting. So you have a vascular graft with a pressure sensors inside. This is important for us because when this patient after operation comes back to us for the control, we just measure uh, the pressure difference to understand if there is a new stenosis or not. So this is very easy for us to follow up the patients. So, but it's becoming more and more available to use 3D bioprinted bio uh, grafts in vascular surgery. Data management is um, also a very hot topic in cardiac surgery because according to the laws in the US, FDA asks for every single cardiac operation to have all the data um, stored. So for example, they need to do after 2022, they need to give the patients a kind of, let's say memory stick or whatever, they say, this is your data of the operation. So this will be used even in, in case of, for example, if the, um, there's a, um, problem and the, the case is going to court, they're using all those memory uh, stick stuff. So this is a, now a must in 2022. And also we need to store all the data we have in the operating room, in the ICU or in, in, the, in the services or in uh, uh, wards. So now companies are um, bringing some new products to measure or store all the data connected in the cardiac surgery. So this is an other, uh, our, uh, other ongoing research with the Thales company. This is a very important uh, company to use data management in the US. And um, they are coming to the operating room, connect all the devices, including ICU. And then you can uh, have a kind of interface with each other. So at the end of the operation, we have every single operation in every single minute of the um, ongoing uh, surgery so that we can use it for research or for some other purposes or quality assessment, et cetera. So they have like the, those kinds of monitoring that you can choose, for example, here, uh, this is from the Cleveland Clinic. They have 18 operating rooms for cardiac surgery. And if you want to check what's going on in room number 10, you click on and you have all the data of the patients. So now we are doing another project with them to understand which patients are going to have acute kidney injury with only coming from the data. So that we follow up those patients. This is another company. It's a Spectrum Medical. It's also very good in the software engineering. And they are bringing some new data management technologies that are available on any hardline machine, ECMO machine, assist devices, or anything else. So, and this is also a very uh, great feature for us because 
um, usually they um, store the data in the iCloud and you can, anytime you can download any information and check for anything. So they store all those data connected to each other with respect to profile, the level, critical high, low. You can set up the parameters what you want. And you can also compare your results with the best practice. So you can have alerts that something is going wrong or whatever. So you can connect your uh, registry with the international registries, and then you can compare each other again with the baseline. So data management has also very uh, bright features as far as that. And telemedicine is also important for cardiac patients. So we now use uh, LifeWatch technology, uh, this just coming from US, for our patients for uh, specific research that's ongoing. So it's very much like iPhone machine. It's connected on the patients and you send the patients back home. And then they store every type of data you, you ask, like the rhythm, ECG, blood pressure, or anything. And also those patients have, um, here is a kind of a very small button. Whenever they feel themselves not good, they press on the button and we have an SMS message uh, from this uh, data center. So we can call them back or we can understand, we can check the device from the monitor we have and we can understand what's going wrong. Um, we follow up those patients up to one month and three months in some specific research we did. So this is the um, outcoming uh, source, the data sheet. So you can um, ask or compare any parameters on this data sheet. And for example, in this case, we published that one month data of those patients having different types of cardiac surgery to compare which one is effective in the long term. You can take, set it up up to three months. And now uh, this company is going on to reduce the size of those things. And so that those patients just only have a very, very small uh, machine to go back home to record everything. And the telemedicine part, maybe you can say robotic surgery, is also a very highly um, growing side of the cardiac surgery, in any surgery, including cardiac surgery. So in, um, especially there are some companies that are updating their robotic systems, let's say every one year, every two years. And the idea is to have a very good 3D vision. This is the most important point. And of course, um, the connections should be very much smoother or the um, movements that you are using in surgery will be very much finer and finer. So it's um, becoming more and more comfortable for any surgeon, not a very skillful surgeon, but any surgeon. For example, when your hand is shaking, let's say you can override the shaking. There's another phase. So it's also very um, much helpful. So they now um, introduce the fourth level improvement of the Da Vinci system, for example, and it's going on every year. And filtration and absorption technologies. So um, it's very important to reuse the salvage blood in cardiac, in any type of surgery, including cardiac surgery, because we have a lot of bleeding during the operation. And blood is becoming more and more valuable now. For example, I can give you an example, especially in COVID era. Uh, in, in Red Crescent in Turkey, in one month, the number of donations is 250,000 units, usually before COVID era. And now it's only 40,000 units. That means there's an 85% drop in blood donations. So sometimes for the first time, let's say for the last 10 years, we started postponing our surgery because we don't have blood. So that means blood salvaging technologies is becoming more and more popular to support, especially in this uh, COVID era or anything else. So hemocep technology was introduced uh, in our group with the Stratlight University for the theoretical part. And we did the first clinical testing and they're now available uh, all over the country. So the idea was to collect the blood, salvage blood in a bag. And there's a specific, a specific chemical inside the bag that absorbs all the uh, fluid that gives back only red blood cells that you transfuse it back to the patient very simply. And it was uh, very, um, uh, attracting uh, product, and it was also a nominee for uh, Times Higher Education Awards. And especially now in Turkey, there's um, a specific project and it's been maintained by European Union plus Minister of Health for the blood management all over the country. 
and it's a third year, uh, three year project, uh, including 22 different surgical societies that we have published six guidelines. And then this training will be given to every type, uh, every uh, physician, nurse, or technician all over the country in three years. So the importance of blood is getting more and more uh, clear now. And for filtration technologies, um, we always do local filtration before with different techniques, with the pore size or some antibody on, on the uh, filters. But the adsorption technologies were growing faster at that time. So we were using interleukin adsorption or some drug toxicity adsorption with the specific filters in our previous research. But now after COVID era, as you know, the uh, cytokine um, storm, we need to use some kind of specific filters. And that's why it's a new era for those filters to become more and more popular now. So especially for COVID patients with a high, um, with a very uh, difficult problems in the ICU, we are using um, specific filters for, to remove inflammatory cytokines. But this is also important that we also use those cytokines here with a specific design in the cardiac uh, heart lung machine to filter some kind of drugs when we have an emergency case. For example, when the patient comes to the cardiology with a chest pain, they do angiography and they give a lot of um, antithrombotic agents to the patients. So when there's something wrong and the patient needs emergency surgery, that means it's, he's going to bleed all over the surgery because he has a lot of antithrombotic drugs received during the cardiology session. So we use these filters to absorb all those drugs from the circulation to let us have a considerable amount of bleeding during the operation. So this is another indication for those filters to be used. And now we are also working on a specific filter on cytokines and also drug, uh, um, drug elimination with, the, with our US uh, partners. Biosensors is, uh, used to be always important for the practical side of cardiac surgery because cardiac surgery is the most dynamic surgery because we are doing operation with respect to time. Because when we cross clamp the heart, the heart stops. So that means we have, let's say, maximum three hours to finish everything. So it's a kind of competition. So we need every measurement be done as quick as possible. So that, that's why we always need biosensors before. And now uh, we have biosensors to detect air in the system or to detect something we ask. For example, this is an air detection system because we don't want air in the circulation, as you know, that they cause air emboli. So this gives us the emboli tracks like this, or they even measure the volume of, of what's passing through as the air um, up to micron level. So um, we also produced a new different uh, optic biosensors, but uh, with my colleagues in Ajatepe University last year, and we uh, introduced the cardiac troponin eye. That's a very significant um, uh, monitoring of the uh, myocardial infarction, and it really worked very well. And now we are finishing our new optic biosensor on fibrinogen levels. And it's also very important because when we are bleeding inside the operating room or in the ICU unit, usually, let's say, 40, 45% of the reason is the um, low levels of fibrinogen. So if you want to measure fibrinogen with the conventional lab systems, it would take up to three, three hours, four hours. So it's a long time for a bleeding patient. That's why we may use optic biosensors to measure um, instantaneously and say, okay, fibrinogen is low or not. So this is very helpful in cardiac surgery. And nanotechnology is also being used by ourselves, especially for storage solutions. As you know, for heart transplantation, when the, uh, the, trans the transplanting heart is um, extracted from the uh, first patient, it's put in a storage solution. So storage solution is just protecting those heart up to six hours or eight hours, let's say. Now the idea is to increase this protection time. That needs, of course, a slow release. Or another point that in the operating room, when we are trying to protect the heart, we give a very specific solution that's called cardioplegia. And that means we are giving about two liters of cardioplegia. It's a solution in seven minutes or five minutes. So this is a huge volume load for the patient. 
But we need to do that because we need to protect the heart during our operation. So nanotechnologically, we are now trying to reduce the volume, just load those solutions on nanoparticles that will re release those type of solutions with respect to temperature, because we are, uh, is, you know, cooling the heart during the operations up to down to sometimes 28, sometimes 32 degrees. So we are measuring of uh, using these nanoparticles to um, release those kind of solutions when we target temperature is reached. And this is also used for storage solutions or heart protection solutions. So this is another um, thesis we have, we have done in Hajjatipa University to put a kind of very specific solutions and reduce it by one to 10%. So this is a very uh, impro a good improvement for to use in cardiac surgery. And artificial intelligence is of course getting more and more um, importance in cardiac surgery, especially in imaging. Because um, there are not societies only focused on cardiac surgery, specific societies all over the world. I'm a member of the International Society of Artificial Intelligence in the US. So the idea is to adapt all those technologies. And first level is now we are focusing on imaging. What, what, I, what do I mean by imaging? For example, when you have an emergency case coming to the emergency unit, and they have a like CT scan, MRI scan, or angiography, and the resident on call is may not decide very good uh, to understand the diagnosis, the real diagnosis. So, artificial intelligence is the first step to um, load or study all those images with a specific diagnosis to retrieve a diagnosis in an incoming emergency patient. So this is the first step. Most of the people are focused on those things. Also. Uh, we are using that in the operating room for different lab levels and how to treat the um, ion differences or something you're measuring those differences and uh, AI systems are uh, being more and more dominant now in any type of surgery, including uh, cardiac surgery. So um, in our uh, case, so we have different, of course, uh, applications. So for research and development, it's okay. Everybody can use, but for clinical practice, it's important because in order to have a very good diagnosis, you're using um, the clinical uh, AI technology. For therapy selection, this is another step um, to use what kind of therapy, especially in they're using now in uh, and the cancer patients, but we don't have many much cancer patients, but we are using, especially in critical limb ischemia or um, some kind of pediatric cases. It's very important uh, way to use, and it has a bright future as far as I believe. And let's come back to the COVID era. As you know, there's now we're talking about COVID era because in clinical practice, we have a real, real difficulty because we have a flood of publications. So and this is a very uh, funny uh, statistics. For example, at the end of the first year, we're going to have approximately 50 million papers on COVID. And all those papers are contradicting with each other. For example, one of them says, you don't, you cannot give, and you cannot use transfusion, blood transfusion, because you may um, affect the uh, COVID on this transfuse to the patient, the COVID um, infection. So some other papers, no, 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 there's not a such possibility to transmit any disease to the patient. So next day you say, okay, the COVID virus is attacking the heme molecule in the blood, and this is very dangerous. And the next day is the no, 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 it's not possible. The, the heme molecule is always fine. So, and we are trying to do, understand whatever we are trying to do. And then every normal is being changed day by day. For example, we are we doing some patients with COVID positive patients with cardiac surgery. And after the surgery, we have many clinical implications that we never understand. For example, we do an operation, it went perfect. And after the surgery, the, the, that the patient has some renal insufficiency. There is no reason. So um, this is a kind of new era to understand. And so it's a challenging era for us to do surgery in especially those kind of patients. So we studied, we published some guidelines, we published some papers to discuss with the possibility or some algorithms to use in COVID patients. But of course, it's changing day by day. And we, unfortunately, it's, we'll go on like this for some more time. So this is another era. So 
any technology related to this will help much in the ongoing uh, site. That's why we are, for example, studying uh, mitochondrial uh, transplantation in lungs in uh, those patients. And this is a new study for us to maintain. Another important problem in Turkey, in cardiac surgery specifically, not to have innovative technologies inside our country is the reimbursement issue. For example, um, there's um, fixed reimbursement packages for cardiac surgery, and it's incredibly low. Let me give an example. For example, if you do a coronary bypass surgery, in, in Europe, the package money is 20,000 euros. In USA, it's 30,000 US dollars. And in Turkey, it's 3,000 dollars. We are doing all the same surgery, but the, um, the American reimbursement system is 10 times more than us. So then it becomes not possible to use any innovation in cardiac surgery because everything is included in this package system. If you are using a new innovative um, equipment or technology or disposable, then the money goes down from the package reimbursement system. So that may be the major reason those, um, let's say, industry is not investing a lot in Turkey for those type of technologies. So, um, and it's not very easy to solve those problems and it's getting worse, unfortunately. And I'm just going to close um, then to discuss, of course, later with you. Um, just try to give some of the headlines that we can um, speak or discuss on that. Uh, and also um, our, our aim is to use every innovative technology as soon as possible in our clinical practice. So from my side, I have this advantage that um, we have our labs in Ankara or in, in England or in Greece. And whenever we have a new technology to use, I can use it clinically in the hospital because we have every type of surgery is being done in the hospital with a large number of patients. So that's a kind of good combination for all sides to use and to test any new technology and hope to collaborate with you also in the new future. Thank you very much. So this is a hospital. We are traveling with this golf cars inside the hospital. And so it's um, a really huge and funny hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you, Serdar Hocam. This was a great talk and overview giving specific uh, uh, highlights in several important uh, fields where technology plays an important role in current cardiovascular practice with an outlook for future. I, I, my guess is that maybe each chapter could be a seminar or something when we go try to go into deep and tr when we're trying to go deep and try to find a opportunity for research or a joint collaborative process, pro project, or even for thesis work, which is probably much more relevant for our students. And some of the, uh, we have also guests from the industry, uh, which are trying to get some uh, new projects started on their own or with university partners. So, and the timing is great. So we have a good 15 minutes for questions and answers. Some further in-depth questions might be uh, might come later on one-on-one, -on -one. but sure. if if they can catch you <laughs> along that big hospital with many uh, responsibilities, I see, and also with many international collaborations and projects. It's thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so the floor is open for questions. So I'm probably will be able to uh, also see the faces of students here. I like to uh, get their uh, faces visible uh, here and we can start with questions. And I also, believe it or not, I also keep an eye on our YouTube uh, uh, streaming video. So if there are questions coming from that side, also I will relay it uh, to you, Professor Gnaiden. Let me ask my kick off few questions that I have on my own because I usually, uh, um, it usually takes time for people to formulate their questions. Uh, they can also ask in Turkish, if yeah. that's okay, that's fine yeah. with us. If they don't have to ask in English, if they, we can always translate the relevant parts for our foreign students and um, international participants. We don't have yet, but we are we definitely looking forward to that one. Yeah. So the first one, I haven't took, uh, watched this mitochondrial uh, transplantation research 
uh, is that really have a clinical practice and uh, does, does, would it be feasible to uh, widespread utilization or it's going to be a very interesting research topic because we know mitochondria are almost a, a symbiotic intracellular parasite, almost a life on its own, but I can see uh, some uh, utility. But what what, what, could, could you could a little bit expand on that? That was very fascinating for me to listen. Thank you. So um, that was first time I, I as I've told you, uh, I saw it in Boston Children's Hospital. So they invested this uh, mitochondrial uh, transplantation um, project 10 years first, because it took them days to uh, retrieve mitochondria from the muscle tissue in the beginning. So they improved, they studied, and they found new techniques. And finally, at the end of 10th year, they were able to harvest mitochondria within less than half an hour and with their own, of course, own technique. And in four years ago, uh, they have five kids in the ICU their own uh, ventricular assist devices and their the, the situation was very much critical. They were expected to be lose those patients. So they received an ethical approval to use only in those five patients because they have no chance to survive. And they said, okay, we have our own technique. We want to do mitochondrial uh, transplantation to these five kids. And they received the permission for only five patients and they applied and three of them survived. That was a great surprise and uh, very much um, interesting right. for everybody. And just four years ago, they did this and now they're using it in different types of uh, surgery. Uh, with it's of course not easy to receive the ethical approval. So that's why we also want, uh, so we sent one of our PhD students to uh, Boston Children's Hospital to learn those techniques from them. And um, one of our colleagues are very good now. He learned everything from there, come back. Okay. And we, he did a lot of um, animal research here because I, my final aim is to do that clinically inside Turkey. But of course, when I go to ask for the uh, ethical permission, I need to say that I have finished those animal studies and then I ask for clinical. So. Uh, from stem cell clinical applications, I have a very good, very significant experience. I have more than 200 patients in critical limb ischemia. We just harvested stem cells from adipose tissue and we um, applied them and we have very good results. But for mitochondrial transplantation, uh, we are now trying to finish our animal studies first to ask for clinical. Not in Turkey, but in Europe and US, clinical applications are available now. Zeldar uh, 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 let me take this opportunity to give you news about some of the developments that are happening at the Center for Life Sciences uh, and Technologies here at Boazich University. We, we are in the middle of procurement of uh, 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 animal imaging uh, equipment, which will involve MRI, uh, 7 Tesla, uh, PET, and uh, CT. Uh, hopefully in an accredited laboratory, and this will be hopefully operational sometime in 2021. Uh, so there will be, of course, initially few things to iron out. Techni technically putting the people will be a challenge, but keep us also in mind that we will be able to do some of very interesting perfusion studies uh, in oh. animals here as well. Uh, I was able to do that uh, similar work with stem cells and peripheric, and peripheric diseases also at N NHLBI. I, I also have some ideas on that. Right. I don't see any other issues. Uh, let me ask you about your take on heart valve. Uh, so the heart valve is, could you give us a little bit specific uh, directions? There are many, many technologies happening there. Yes. With Tavi uh, and different biocompatible ones, fully biological ones, and biomaterials, mix, mixtures. Is, do you think there are still some opportunities for sure. research for graduate students and also commercially yes. for startups in there? Or is it very big players market now? It, it is too late for that. Mm -hmm. yeah, especially for Tavi, that means um, trans, um, when, when we are doing in the, in the cat lab. So they are doing incredible investment on Tabi. For example, uh, they organize a lot of research. And four years ago, 
and Tavi was uh, available for only high-risk patients because they say, okay, we don't know the uh, long-term results. That's why you can do it for like 85 to 90 years old patient. For example, I don't want to um, do an open surgery for 85 year old, 90 year old patient, but I can do Tavi in the cat lab and it's easy. And then after two years, they say, oh, okay, the um, high risk patient results are perfect. You can do it on the middle risk patients. And last year they say, you can use Tavi for any patient. So this was a huge um, development for the Tavi supporters. But in Turkey, as I've told you in, in the conclusion, the, the point is, for example, uh, the heart wall in Turkey is the re reimbursement is 3,000 Turkish lira for one mechanical heart wall, 15,000 uh, Turkish lira for uh, bioprosthesis, and 85,000 Turkish lira for Tavi. So um, we cannot use Tavi for every patient. This is impossible to do a reimbursement. So for reimbursement, we have really very tough criteria. Okay, it should be up over that age, and associated diseases or whatever. But um, in US now, it's available for any patient. So nearly, in the, let's say in, in a few years, cardiac surgeons will not be able to do any aortic operations in US because all of them will be done in the cat lab. So there is still place for Tavi to, to do some new modifications. Uh, I I see that uh, I, I I clearly get the message here for re or reimbursement uh, uh, procedures and principles or the uh, the way we arrange the reimbursement here in Turkey doesn't foster technological development greatly. But that's a take home message to hopefully listening ears at the bureaucratic level or some people at higher ups. But giving, staying on the positive side for the students and some startups here, uh, continuing on the same page, is the uh, European Union project on blood uh, yes. still, on, still going? Is there a yes. web page that you can share with us? Uh, yes, or, yes. Uh, because uh, it wasn't there, uh, is it still on, ongoing? That seems to be a very interesting project. Sure, it's, it's just new to begun, I, I can say. And this is the first year, and it was going. It's going to be uh, last for two more years at least, maybe more. And it's really an exciting project. And, and it's the the, uh, the Instagram page or uh, the uh, they have a page. It's called hastakanunitimi.com in Turkish. Dot com. Mm -hmm. I can send you uh, their address also later. Okay, this is all, uh, not. Doesn't seem to be a government project. It is more like a private or because No, it's um, it's supported by Ministry of Health plus an European Union project together. It's okay. a joint project. joint project. Excellent. I spoke too much, but everybody seems to be listen, listening or the dialogue doesn't ask questions. Maybe is, I mean any feedback, comments, nothing from the audience. Are you guys alive? I <laughs> I see the faces, but nothing uh, coming on. Oh, John, pardon. I have a question. Alreza, is that you? Yeah. Uh, go, go ahead. Okay. And also, I'm the international uh, student. Yeah, oh, I don't okay. know Turkish. Yo, you, okay, because you fine. told that we don't have any international students here. No, no, we have. That's why. <laughs> we never have. Yeah. We love them. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question. Uh, regarding the, the page you showed, a 3D printed uh, vessel, I, since I'm a chemist, it is always fascinating for me to know about the 3D printing of those materials that they implant inside the body. So I just wanted to know about the material of that uh, 3D printing and how the uh, how the steps uh, is taken for 3D printing. Yes, thank you. So um, the idea is to first to collect um, the cellular part of those um, vascular grafts. So um, we have like a CT scan or MRI scan or angiography. So we measure the sizes of the graft first. And then we have the size. And then we have cells that we can usually put, um, harvest them from the adipose tissue of the patient. And then you can have the, um, the, 
biopolymer side. So it, it, it may change from one center to another, but the idea is to use a biopolymer plus cells printed on with respect to dimensions of what, what you have measured uh, on, on the CT scan or MRI scan. But biopolymer is changing from one center to another. So there are many different uh -huh. biopolymers. Okay, thank you. So the idea is that you, you can have biodegradable material if you are using in some specific areas in vascular surgery. And you can, of course, arrange the duration of degradation, let's say three months, six months, one year or whatever. It depends on the organ you are doing the um, anastomosis. Okay, thank you. See? Excellent. So, uh, this, is there a... I don't see some questions here. Let me continue with my a few inquiries while I'll catch you uh, here um, on our seminar. Uh, how about this, this point of care uh, sensor technologies? Uh, that seems to be, this is, seems to be a very, very important topic for yes. troponin A or fibrinogen in two different applications, especially for at home. Yes. And also near the bedside even yeah. for some uh, critical care patients that necessarily be, falls into a point of care technology, but more like a real time monitoring technology maybe. So is, 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 this, is this something you are currently actively working on? Uh, is, this, uh, is this something that you would recommend to our students? Because we have yes. also a similar technology capability to, at our institute to work on some of these. Uh, at, I, in our I very much recommend, because in order to compete with the Turkish reimbursement problem, this is a very good step to use because, for example, in if you want to buy a viscoelastic testing machine in Turkey, it's incredibly expensive. Plus, the disposables, the, the kits of those systems is 13 euros per one measurement. So it's incredibly high for Turkish systems. So in this uh, biosensors or uh, real-time monitoring systems, we manufacture we, um, the uh, use of those sticks and they are very, very much affordable with respect to the ones we are using in viscoelastic testing. So, for example, one viscoelastic testing for fibrinogen level is 13 euros for viscoelastic testing. And for us, it's only about one euro uh, in our side. So it's very um, compatible and affordable system. Okay, so that's definitely something to pursue there. Sure. Right? Yeah, I mean, I so uh, I don't know whether Hassan Ure has left or not, but they are definitely working on uh, some other point of care blood measurement systems. Uh, they should investigate sure. uh, that technology, and it, this is something very important. I mean, uh, yes. for, for uh, and do you think in terms of the biomarker of troponin one, do you believe that's the good target for MI, MI screening? Yes, it still is, because even in, um, in a routine uh, hospital, in, in, even in third level hospital, the first parameter that we're searching is the troponin eye levels when, when we see the first time for the patients. So even it's easy in the first patient coming to the emergency unit, or there's another indication to use in the ICU patient when the clinical situation is changing, you say, oh, is an impending MI or not? So you can measure troponin eye very quickly. I see. Okay, excellent. I think uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask enough questions, I guess. It, or our time is up, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, it, are there any comments or an additional from the students? Let me check out the uh, YouTube channel also. Uh, I don't know where, where it is, by the way. I don't see any questions there either. Please, Matt, let me know if there is otherwise. Uh, 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 Sadar we, we, we would like to keep this uh, seminar uh, on our record at our uh, YouTube sure. channel, if you approve. Uh, of course. Uh, we have no control of who is storing what during the live streaming, but at the end of the, if there are additional things that you want to cut out or you want to uh, edit, please let us know. Is there any uh, last uh, uh, statements that you would like to share to an yeah, audience sure. of biomedical engineering students coming from a diverse background. Of course. Uh, uh, and some uh, uh, also uh, 
academic academicians at our university and elsewhere and a few startups yeah we have a, still a mixed audience of uh, close to 50 people watching us are there any last minute words or uh, yes so I, statements? I really want to thank you very much sir for your uh, very uh, prestigious invitation and um, of course i feel very much um, pleased to be with the biomedical engineering uh, group always so um, from my point of view, I can say I always believe innovation research in my country. So I am always um, able to cooperate with any of my colleagues here. As I've told you, we have our um, lab and we, of course, are much better than the labs that we have here. But we also have a clinical application um, opportunity. So um, I'm always ready to do any kind of cooperation with any of my students, any of your students or my colleagues. And I always believe uh, we would have some kind of feature in our country by um, do, doing those improvements and innovations. Yeah, I, I mean, thank you, thank you very much for this uh, very uh, excellent and exciting presentation that gives us uh, very much a new uh, um, horizon and motivation to our students and to our entrepreneurs, I believe. So there are. I mean, we are currently, uh, I, I can summarize it like this. I mean, there are many, many things to do at cardiovascular engineering. Currently, our institute is uh, also focusing on neural engineering applications, but they are sharing many technologies or, or, uh, across both uh, fields in terms of endovascular minimal invasive surgeries and some imaging. So I think we we should we, we we should continue to work on both fronts and support students who are willing to work that, uh, and also our uh, 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 accredited clean room uh, facilities with uh, medical uh, plastic and uh, metal processing capabilities, as well as the new upcoming animal imaging facilities, will provide a, hopefully is some other additional capabilities uh, for researchers from any university or industry who like to pursue more ambitious uh, ambitious uh, projects and hopefully by that time some of the support and, and reimbursement strategies and some other governmental initiatives will be made to support this ecosystem further sure. uh, so we can develop the things in in our the country first, and then hopefully export it, this scientific technological uh, knowledge and our products to additional countries worldwide. We will be part of the solution. Yes. Thank you, Professor Thank Gnagy, you much, for this sir. excellent Thank talk. Look, Thank it you. was a good opportunity to catch up with you. Thank you. Uh, hopefully, we'll, uh, do, we'll do much more uh, meetings like that in a better time. Sure. after this pandemic and we will learn the lesson from this pandemic and uh, come to a better world yes, thank, thank you. you thank you very much thank you. okay guys no questions it's <laughs> over so uh, matt is gonna pull out the plug everybody continue with their own work and seminars bye 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 thank you